we need to be looking at is why is the soil like the soil? What are we doing to produce the soils that we are producing? You know, we should have a personal concern. These seeds need to be watered, and we need to be watering them with our tears, with, it, with our concerns about people's lives, which means that we were praying for them as well. We need to realize that it's a partnership thing. Uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. And it's not about competing with other fields. It's everybody giving the same seed and realizing that we're fellow workers. And we need to have patience. James 5 says, see how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the early and later rains. So put the seed out there and don't expect it tomorrow to produce all of the harvest that ultimately God may bring out of your obedience in the moment of planting that seed. Be willing to wait. And here Jesus says that one little seed had the potential to multiply itself 3,000, 6,000, even 10,000 times over. It's not one for one. But, uh, you know, never change the seed to accommodate a particular type of, of soil. I, I've, I've spoken to some tough soil. When we first moved to Kansas City some years ago, I didn't have a church for about three months, and I didn't know I was going to have a church three months later, so I just wanted to preach somewhere. And so I called the Kansas City Rescue Mission. Can I come and preach? And it ended up we were bringing food. With the, after I did get a church, church later, we were bringing all these different foods and things, but uh, as well as preaching the message. And so there, these people at the, uh, that would come to the rescue mission had to listen to me before they could eat their food. They didn't come there to listen to me. They came there to get the food and to have a bed for the night. And some of them, when I was preaching, they were glaring at me. They were angry. They didn't like me. Whatever happened in their life, you know, I represented some extension of that. There'd be a couple over there, amen, amen, where's the food? You know, they, I, there was a little bit of positivity. But I was preaching to some hard soil. Some very hard soil. It would have been a lot easier if I would have gone into a soil-sensitive message and tried to tell them, and said, what can I tell them? It'll make them happy right now. You're going to be rich. This is only temporary. Trust God. He'll make you rich. You'll win the lottery. Go buy a ticket. I had twice the guys next week. You also have the soils, four different kinds of soil. And uh, the different ones you've got beside the road, the birds came and ate it up. You got the rocky places, didn't have much depth. And so uh, the sun scorched it and they had no roots, so they withered. You had those that were thrown among thorns and they, thorns came up with them and choked them out and others on the good soil, which were, were yielded this large crop. Now, I got to thinking about that, and I, it, it reminded me of my golf game. So I thought about the parable of the par. The parable of the par. par. Y'all look like, what in the world is he going to say? A golfer went out to golf, and the ball fell in four different areas of the, on the course. One ball flew into the woods, was never seen again, probably in a bird's nest somewhere. That, that would be my golf game. Another ball looked good at first, but it landed on unpredictive, unproductive ground. A sand trap. After frustration trying to move it with his club, the golfer gave up and went back to the golf cart. Too much persecution and affliction. The third ball landed in the weeds, the out-of-bounds area. The high weeds made the normal play difficult, and the game was unfruitful. And the last ball landed on good ground, the fairway. And the game was fruitful and productive to the point of pars, birdies, eagles, and even a hole in one. Keep the ball on the good soil. That's the way to win the game. Do the best of the game. Don't put it in the weeds. All these things that choke out your 
your attempts to, to reach lives, people are just accumulated in all the things of the world. We're not get somewhere where Satan says, I got it now. The hard ground. Or to put it in a sand trap, unproductive ground. That frust when the struggle of, of trying to produce there is going to wither away and disappear. The hard soil is the road, which would be the narrow footpaths that would go between where a better soil would be. And it, it, it would become hard as concrete because you'd have travelers, you'd have uh, animals that would, would walk on it, and it wouldn't penetrate this type of soil, 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 and it would remain exposed. So the seed's just sitting there on top of this hard concrete like soil, soil. and what happens when you throw seed out in your yards or birds birds that's why they put scarecrows out there to protect things from birds birds are predators they're predators for seeds and Jesus explains this in verse 19 he says when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it the evil one comes and snatches it away because it Satan comes in, uh, in Mark what has been sown in his heart this is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. So the gospel is given, but there's such a hardness and such a resistance that it doesn't penetrate at all, and it just disappears. Take it away. Satan says, I'll take that. Let me have that. Let me give you a little argument. Ah, got that seed back before it got too deep in there. I mean, they are so hard, they're just receptive anything that fights against the gospel and so the gospel doesn't penetrate their heart and of course satan is always waiting hosea says that we need to be in the business of getting rid of this hardness in our heart hosea says so to yourself in righteousness reap in mercy this is hosea 10 12 break up your fallow ground doesn't say, God, break my fallow ground. It says, you, break up your fallow ground. For it's time to seek the Lord till he comes and, rain, uh, and rains righteousness upon you. Get your heart, get your life ready. Realize the dangers of your life and get your life prepared for God's coming. He's promised he will. He'll be faithful. Are you going to be ready when God faithfully comes to impact your life, to reach out to you. It's not God's fault. It's not the seed's fault. It's not the sower's fault. It's your fault. It's the soil. You didn't break up your fallow ground. You didn't repent. You didn't spend time before God where God could convict you and speak into your life. You didn't get into God's word and let it draw into your life as well. And so when the gospel came, all you had heard was what the world's got to say. You were hard ground. And Satan was ready to, to steal away anything God wanted to do. And people like this, they ridicule, they attack the gospel, they reject it, and their lives remain empty. And then they get mad about that. When Satan attacks our spiritual lives, he attacks the word. The word of God. We think, well, Satan's attacking me. I'm sick. I, I lost my job. I mean, that's side stuff for Satan. He hates the Word of God. Whatever he can do in your life to make you resistant to the Word of God, that's the only thing that threatens him, is you're being receptive to that, transformed, and being able to use it like a sword, like a weapon against him. Anything else, yeah, he wants us miserable. Sure he does. That's not going to hurt him in the long run. The word of God is the weapon fashioned against him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And the quicker he can remove that word from our, our life before it has a chance to transform us, the uh, better off that he is. And, and for some people in a church, it will be taken away. That word's gone before they walk out the door after church service. 
shallow soil, shallow soil, which is, is rocky soil. Uh, a lot of places in, in, in Palestine, you know, there's a parable or a story that says when the angels were spreading out the rocks, they dropped half their load in, in Israel or in Palestine. There's rocks everywhere. And there's this limestone plate or whatever that varies in its depth. But many parts of Israel, the soil isn't very deep. And so they would be very familiar with this. They got this limestone rock layer that is there right just below the topsoil. And so the soil may look good and productive and you throw seed in there. And because it's got that, that under rock there, it warms that soil quicker. And so it germinates the seed quicker. And so it pops up quicker. But when the sun really starts to scorch, it also cooks it quicker and destroys it. Jesus said this in verse 20, the one on whom seed was sown in the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no firm root in himself, but only temporary. And when affliction and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls, falls away. These are the folks who, who make maybe an emotional response. It says here that they receive it with joy. We like that. And joy? Let me warn you, joy is not the indicator of a real act of God in your life. It may be a diversion from it. Sadness is probably a better indicator. Humility, broken heart, a broken and contrite spirit, O Lord, David said. Give me that. Repentance. And the tears that come with that. A brokenness over the sin in your life are better indicators and oh joy I love this message sounds like it's going to be good for me and perhaps they heard this shallow presentation of the gospel that present, presents all these benefits without sharing any kind of cost they know nothing about repentance dying to self turning away from the old life that's why in Luke 14, Jesus says, calculate or count the cost of building a tower. But you know, the verse that precedes that, verse 30, 30, uh, 27 says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple for which one of you builds a tower. If you're not willing to carry a cross and really be his disciple, don't start building a tower. And it's like bookends because it ends up with uh, none of you can be my disciple unless he gives up all his possessions. The salt may be good, the salt becomes tasteless. How's it going to be seasoned? Either uh, it is either useless for the soil or for the newer pyres, power, pile, it is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So in the middle of that, You've got this, don't build a tower if you're not going to be able to finish it. And it, it also talks about uh, a man who has 10,000 coming against him. Go send a delegation to make peace because you can't handle them. You don't have the guys. Now, don't get into something that you are not realizing what that something is. And if you don't have a cross that you're carrying into this, you're not prepared. You're not ready. 1 John 2.19 says they went out from us because they were not really of us. They just kind of got inoculated with this flimsy presentation followed by a false present profession of, of faith. And uh, they got excited. Maybe they got active. Maybe they, accept, they were accepted as a real deal. But they had no depth and it was just waiting for persecution or affliction. There are many people in churches today that are only gonna be there until their next hard moment. Then they're gone. That wasn't part of the presentation. They didn't buy this product based on that. And they may run well for a good, for a while, but eventually the Bible says, dog goes back to his vomit. Where his true nature is, and the pig back to the to the mud hole. You know, if the Lord saves you, He's going to change your life. He's going to. He, 
You may stray out of his will, but you will not stay out of his will. What he does in you will last. I mean, you may fail, you may struggle, but you will not leave God's house. I mean, you will stray, but you'll be back. You will be back. You'll be back. You cannot live without his presence, his throne, his word, his people. And one of the quickest ways to identify a lack of genuineness is persecution. That's why God allows it. It outs us. It shows us the truth about our, ourselves as well as deepening our intimacy with, uh, with God. And if we have no spiritual depth to deal with it, then we wither under it. If we are genuine, when difficulty comes, the roots are still there. If the roots aren't there, then we wither and we disappear. But it shows us whether we really have root. If we're the genuine, genuine thing. And for a lot of people, God's word has a shallow place in their life. It's like this plaque on the wall and encouragement or a hope that they uh, end up in heaven. It's not the, it's not deep within them. A driving force, a weapon. It's not, not those things that are, tra it's not what's transformed them. And God intends us as Christians to allow his word to go deep in our hearts. He intends that his word would not just be one influence in our life, but the major influence in our life. Oh, nothing good on TV tonight? Well, Lord, where's my Bible? It's to be the major player in our heart. It's the word of God is supposed to be. It's, it's what we look to when we determine our priorities, our decisions, our directions in life. You know, it's supposed to be that influence. Not popular opinion or political correctness. You know, Ray Comfort, he's a Christian apologist. And he sets this scenario of being on an airplane. And while you're on this airplane, the, the uh, flight attendant gives everybody a parachute. He said, I want you to put this parachute on. And so everybody puts it on, and man, it's uncomfortable. I can't relax in the seat. Why? It's heavy. And then she says, well, I need to let you know that we don't have enough fuel to make it to our destination. And everybody in here is going to have to make a jump. You can do it with or without the parachute. That parachute may seem uncomfortable, but you're going to appreciate it later. It's essential for your survival. This is not about your comfort. It's about your survival. Some people preach a non-parachute Christianity of comfort. And they're not ready for the destiny. They're not ready for the job. The parachute, yeah, Christianity is going to be in this world, in this plane ride, cumbersome, difficult. You are going to be on a narrow path. You are going to be very different from a world that's steeped in darkness. The world's going to react against that. There's going to be trials, going to be tribulation. But we're prepared for the end of this destination. And they are not. John 15 says, If you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Satan wants to get that word out of you so you won't bear fruit, so you won't be his disciples. And persecution just reinforces to me when people persecute, ridicule, it reinforces to me that by God's grace, I know a God that many others don't. It reinforces that I could be on the other side persecuting others. Or like Saul holding the coat, coats of those who were stoning Stephen. That I could have no hope beyond this life like they do. You know, the joy that I can have is knowing that one day I'm going to close my eyes in this world and open them in God's presence. And we're filled with a world that does not have that hope. 
that is very receptive to being weaponized by Satan. And he hates the most those who have the uh, image of God implanted on them. And they are the target of his attack. So we don't fight against flesh and blood. The crowded soil. This soil looks ready, but underneath it are the roots of thorns and weeds. It gives every indication of a harvest, but it's producing not just um, trying to produce the seed, but it's also got something that's choking the resources from the seed, the plant, and uh, it causes the plant to be unfruitful. If so many people buy into this world, all the things that the world wants to throw at you, um, and, and it gives a list here. The one who was sown among thorns, this man hears the word, and then it says the worry of the world, the deceitfulness of, of wealth choke the world, and it becomes un, unfruitful. So all the things that you have to be concerned about in the world, and then the deceitfulness of riches. You know, riches, they're deceitful. They lie. Money lies. The whole idea that it's going to make your life better, it's a lie. It's a deceitfulness. But people grab onto those things and not realizing it comes with a great cost in your relationship with God. You know, we often do white elephant gifts. White elephant gifts, that came out of what's now Thailand. It was Siam back then. And they would give an albino elephant. That would be like this prize, revered prize that you could give somebody. The problem was somebody gives you an elephant or a number of elephants and you cannot kill these white elephants. So now you gotta take care of an elephant. You gotta feed it, you gotta clean up after it. That's what a white elephant gift is meant to be. That's why we carry it over. It's something that, that chokes out your resources and rules you by the upkeeping costs of it. What presents itself as something very attractive from the world carries a high cost of worry and, and deceitfulness. And it chokes out the freedom that we would have to follow Christ with all these cumbersome things. There was a young man who proposed to a girl. He said, darling, I want to know that, I want you to know that I love you more than anything else in the world. I want you to marry me. I'm not rich. I don't have a yacht or a Rolls Royce like Johnny Brown, but I do love you with all my heart. She thought for a minute and said, you know, I do love you with all my heart too, but could you tell me more about Johnny Brown? He got her attention. This person tries to have all the benefits by clinging to their old life. They just want to add Jesus. Try to get some benefits out of out of him. They still live in their same worldly ways. They still got their old friendships. The same, they watch the same TV and movies. They still worry and fret about things as if God's not going to make a difference. And their life is all about themselves. It's not about God. And the seed of the gospel cannot produce fruit in a heart filled with other things. And this kind of person may begin well, but it is soon choked out as the things of the world come back in with a day. Think about weeds, they grow fast. They grow easy. Nobody out there watering weeds. You don't have to. They just pop up while you're trying to water and cultivate something that's of value. The weeds just keep jumping in there. And worry and greed and fleshy things, they, they'll grow up so quick in your life. They're just roots waiting to spring if you're not if you're not ready for them. They will begin to choke out. A relationship with God. A ground needs to be prepared by what we need to receive, which is persecution and affliction. But we're preparing our ground for riches and things of this world. The good soil, the last one, this ground has been prepared, it's been worked, it's been plowed, it's been tilled. And it's ready for the, the seed whenever the sower shows up and casts it their way. Verse 23 says, 
The one whose seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and brings forth some hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. This, this is a heart where it naturally takes the seed in and produces. It's just ready for God to speak into their life. It, it just desires it. It's like a deer panting for the water brook. His number one passion in the day is God speak into my life today. Use me today. Open opportunities for my life today. And this, this is a seed, the only seed that really brought fruit that was meaningful was the one that was prepared good soil. The others didn't bring anything of, of value even though the seed was attempted to be planted in them. Same seed. So there are going to be people who go to the same church, they heard the same sermons, they had the same Bible, they may even sat in the same pew, may even be from the same family. But they're totally different souls. And the seed will identify that. How they treat the seed. And for some today, the enemy can steal it quick. I mean, you may have brought so many bitterness and arguments and been listening to, to all these attacks and uh, you got so much for the seed to penetrate. For others, you understand the surface things, but you don't, don't understand surrender, especially when persecution and affliction comes. Others are so locked into this world that uh, the things they enjoy, they don't want to give up anything of the world. They actually probably want to make it spiritualized, like health and wealth and things like that. Experts say that that tenfold is an average harvest, thirtyfold is good, sixtyfold is excellent, and one hundredfold is amazing. And that's exactly what God wants for us: is one hundredfold. And again, Satan is interested in the Word of God in you. He's interested in the Word of God out of you. But we resist him firm in our faith. Faith comes by hearing God's Word. He wants us disarmed because John said, this is the victory that's overcome the world, our faith, which comes from God's Word. Hebrews says, without faith, we're not pleasing to God. And certainly Satan doesn't want us to be pleasing to God. Hebrews also says faith is the assurance and conviction, and that assurance and conviction is based on what God has promised He said in His Word. That's where we draw our conviction and assurance from. Now, how many in our church are productive? How many are producing fruit? Many we once knew are now gone. Their hearts hardened, or they left after things became difficult, or they became bitter, disillusioned. Others come, but are receivers instead of producers. They're here to receive rather than to give, to be served rather than to serve. Their walk uh, with God is being choked by the things of the world. Their focus is more there than here, even when they are here. You can tell by their salute. That's the salute. Those are... <laughs> Thankfully, there are some serving and productive here in our church, and we would not survive, survive without them. But which group are you? I read this this morning, and I'll close with it. It's talking about the temple veil, and the temple veil is that which covers the, uh, the Holy of Holies, and the inside of the Holy of Holies is the Ark of the Covenant, which, which is the presence of God. On the veil is embroidered a two-dimensional representation of the cherubim with height and width uh, but it's missing one dimension which is depth behind the veil inside the holy of holies was the ark of the covenant on top of which were figures of the cherubim, cherubim in gold the cherubim in three dimensions 
So outside the veil, one sees the cherubim in two dimensions. But from inside the veil, which represents the presence of God, one sees them now in three dimensions. This is what it says. There are realities that you can never know until you go beyond the veil and dwell in the presence of God. Realities waiting in the depth of God's presence. The depth of faith, the depth of prayer, and worship. Compared to that which lies in the presence of God, everything you've known in the world is like a two-dimensional drawing on a piece of parchment. And all your ideas of God are like two-dimensional images embroidered on a veil. Make it your aim to go beyond the veil into the secret place of the Holy of Holies and dwelling and dwelling in his presence beyond the woven image of cherubim into the reality of the most high. Don't settle for the embroidered outer things. That's why the fourth soil is so important. That's inside the veil. That's the presence of God. We shouldn't settle for anything else. And we shouldn't allow, just because we're in a culture that is mostly bad soil because of what we have uh, embraced here in this, this nation, we need to be different. We need to stand aside from what it entices us with to pursue God with that, with that passion to get inside the veil I don't want anything less than a three dimensional experience with God let's pray